Hello and welcome to YLab, a makerspace that operates in the old workshops of the basement of the beautiful David Dunlap Observatory, where the big telescope dome is all metal, your tongue can freeze on it, but you won't be poisoned because they took off all the lead paint and recoded it in the summer of 2020. This is lesson one on our ham rules and regulations. This is an easy section, so go for 95% on the quiz. Who regulates amateur radio in Canada? Industry Canada sets the rules. So here's our hint for the quiz. The Act gives the authority. Look at those capital A's. And the regulations define the amateur service. Yeah, I'm putting emphasis on stuff. This is stuff where when you roll through the questions and the quiz, you will remember. Now, that's who does the rules in Canada. In another country, that country's rules apply, period. Now, what happens if we're communicating between countries? There's an organization called the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, uh, that countries participate and set the rules for, but they have to be members and they have to agree, and the individual country rules will still override whatever's in the ITU agreements. Now, ITU is divided into regions. Europe is region one because international standards come out of Europe, so of course they're region one. And then, you know, North America wants next in line, or all the Americas actually. So, or, so we're in ITU region two, and the rest of the world, Asia, Oceania, Africa, are in region three. Now, again, individual countries can have their own rules, and you have to check on that. So if some country named Slobovia or something has rules that say they're not allowed to communicate with you in Canada, then you don't communicate with them. And if you know you're talking to somebody in another country, you are responsible for checking. If you were to make a contact on the radio and they say, Hi, I'm, in, I'm in Slobovia, you need to stop, go to the RAC site or another site, check it out, and see if you're allowed to communicate with them. Who's allowed to get a license? Well, it's pretty simple. If you have an address in Canada, you're allowed to get a license. There is no age limit, period. That's it. You just need an address in Canada. Our two official languages are English or French. So when you're on the air, you're going to use your call sign. It'll be VA3 in three letters. So let's say VA3 ABC. Um, and that must be translated or must be transmitted in English or French when you're on the air. Other than that, any language is good, but those call signs need to be called out to identify you in either English or French. Your license is valid for life. Once you get through that test, you will never have to take it again. And it's free. Now, free, but you're going to have to get tested. And that test will be done by a certified examiner, or you can go into an Industry Canada office and do it for 20 bucks. And if you fail, you can go in as many times as you want, annoy the people there, and just keep paying 20 bucks for every instance. Your examiner, if you find an independent examiner, and the best place to get one is contact your local ham radio club, get to know them, uh, they're allowed to charge a reasonable fee because they have to drive to see you and things like that. Uh, and it's usually pretty reasonable. Often it's free. The ham radio clubs may organize a test day or something. So most of them are not after this for their money. But just remember, they are being very generous with their time. If one comes out for free, you know, buy them a coffee or lunch or something. There are three and a half levels of license in Canada. Uh, the basic, uh, the, the slide is wrong. You have to get 70% on the test. 
Now, this allows you in the amateur bands above 30 megahertz. Okay. Below 30 megahertz, you're allowed on a basic license if you take the further step of learning Morse code, which uh, ham people call CW. And you have to get up to five words per minute on your Morse code, sending and receiving. Okay. You've also got power limits. Uh, there's all kinds of funky terms here. This is going to be a little bit of memorization for you to remember. And again, we'll work through this on the test quizzes. Uh, so you've got a 250 watt to the anode. Uh, transmit power is 560 watts peak single sideband. Don't worry, you'll learn what that means. And otherwise, it's 200 watts. Uh, so that's a basic license. Uh, basic with honors, if you get 80% or better on the test, then you're allowed to transmit on bands below 30 megahertz. Now, what does that mean? The higher the frequency, the less distance you get out of it. The lower the frequency, the more distance you get and the less power you need for making that distance. So those Bands below 30 megahertz are the ones that will get you communicating long distances across the country, across the hemisphere, and even around the world. So those, uh, those frequencies are considered a little more precious, and you got to get the higher mark. There's also an advanced license. Now, the advanced license gives you some other privileges. Uh, you can make your own homemade equipment, and essentially you're certifying it yourself. Uh, you can set up repeaters, which allow retransmission over long distances. The local clubs set up repeaters. They're great. You can use just a little handheld. If you can reach the repeater, then you can use that to link through different technologies all over the world. You're also allowed more power. So your base power to anode goes up to 1,000 watts. That's four times what the, uh, the basic operators are allowed. Uh, your transmit goes up to 2,250 watts, uh, peak on single sideband, and 750 watts for other transmission. That is a lot of power. Uh, people are communicating around the world with 100 watts on voice. People are communicating around the world with 5 watts with Morse code. So this is some pretty serious stuff. Um, and then, uh, as we mentioned before, if uh, you have BASIC and you get a Morse certification, then you'll be the same as BASIC with honors. You'll be able to use those nice bands below 30 megahertz. It, there are some special privileges with an amateur radio license. You can use your radio while driving. Again, it's not really recommended, but you can get hands-free and stuff. Uh, but you make sure you keep your pocket license with you. And uh, many amateur radio operators have their call sign on their license plates. And so uh, the, some of the police officers will see that, might see you with a handheld, and they won't pull you over. If they pull you over, make sure you have your ham license with you. Uh, there are constant efforts to try and revoke this. And there are even bigger efforts from the ham community to keep that privilege. And a lot of the justification for that is that volunteering stuff I mentioned in some of the intro material uh, where they're helping out with emergency preparedness and emergency services. Now, when you get your license, uh, Industry Canada will send you a pocket license that you carry in your wallet and the main license, which is a big certificate. That main license must stay at the home station address. So remember, we said the only criteria to get your license in Canada was to pass the test and have an address in Canada. So your license, the main license, the full sheet size has to stay there. Uh, so that's the address you provide to Industry Canada. You have to advise Industry Canada of a change of address. Industry Canada can also request your license on 48 hours notice. So if you are transmitting somewhere 
they can request that. Uh, and that's something they request. They can't come into your house, not without a warrant. So the regular rules apply. So again, the only thing they can request, unless you're doing something highly illegal, of course, is your license on that 48 hours notice. General amateur radio rules. Okay. It's a bunch of frequencies assigned for amateur use only. And you're only allowed to transmit on those frequencies. Think about it. If you have a radio station locally on FM 99.9, certainly a lot of amateur radios are capable of transmitting on that frequency. But are you allowed? No, because that's licensed exclusively to a, co to a commercial operator. So same way, there are frequencies allocated just for amateur radio, uh, and that's the only place you're allowed. And nobody else is allowed on those frequencies. They are reserved for us as amateur radio operators. Okay. Now, when you're using those frequencies, they are only to be used for communication between licensed amateurs. Okay. There is one exception to that, U.S. and Canadian military message relay. So you will see that come up fairly frequently in the test questions. Who are you allowed to communicate with? Just licensed amateurs. What's the exception? The Canadian military mess, Canadian U.S. military message relay. Okay. You can only do non-business communications. You cannot do business on amateur radio frequencies. You know, amateur for the love of it, for the fun of it. Uh, within rules, you, as an amateur radio operator, uh, you are allowed to use RC devices, remote control. So if you're into drones, you're into model cars, uh, a lot of the people do that want to get their amateur radio license so they can use frequencies that the other guys aren't allowed to use. Uh, so that can give them better control, reduce interference. Uh, get longer range to control their devices. It's a big advantage for that technology to have your amateur radio license. Everything that goes out of the air must be public. You cannot be transmitting secret messages. You can do codes, you can do encryption, but the algorithm and the keys have to be public and available. Okay? And so just like the internet, Avoid personal information when you're on the air. Anybody can listen at any time with the right receiver. They can listen to you a long distance away. So stay away from personal info. Keep it clean. Okay. When's a code not a code? So we said we're not allowed to use encryption or we can use encryption as long as it's published. But there's other kind of codes that amateur radio operators use. Uh, there's the phonetic alphabet. Uh, you'll be seeing some of this, you know, alpha, uh, A for alpha, B for bravo, uh, and so on. Um, and that's used to make communication clear. So, you know, you're spelling your name. If your name is Joe, you'll say Juliet Oscar Echo, just to clear up that communication. So it may sound like a code, but it's not really. And then there's Q codes. You'll have people saying QTH, asking for location. QTZ to ask who it is. Some of these come up on the test. And uh, our notes don't give you the whole thing. They cover the ones you're going to need for the test. That's another reason we tell you to pick up that great reference book. So uh, you can get all those codes and learn a little more about how to use them. Uh, a lot of those codes came out of Morse code, and in particular the railways and sometimes the military services. Uh, and that was to save their fingers when they were punching that stuff out, get the messages out faster. And uh, yeah, it really dates back to railroad usage. And we actually know some local retired railroad Morse code operators who can key as fast as they can talk. Uh, the better ones can even key at the same time as they're talking. It's quite impressive to watch. Hey, we talked about this in our uh, intro to the material. Manners, manners, manners. 
don't interrupt others on the frequency. If you're going to go on the frequency and start communicating, the first thing you do is listen. Is anybody else talking? And unless it's an emergency, you wait for a break. You don't hog. You don't sit there yabbering away. Do some pauses. Give somebody else a chance to break in. It might be important. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons where it can be important. And while you're transmitting, they can't. Shut up. Take a breath once in a while. Give somebody else a chance. Is anybody else using the frequency? You know, when you come on, you may not hear anything, but ask, ask if it's clear. Sometimes uh, there are groups that have time scheduled on there. You might just be on during a pause or something. And be prepared to give up the frequency for priority users. So, you know, if you've got a group who booked that frequency for what's called a net, a group of people getting together for something, and there are a lot of those happening out there, uh, you get on, uh, you know, you give that up to them. Otherwise, it's whoever was there first. But again, if you can move off to another frequency, you know, be polite, do it. And again, on the test, uh, any answer, any question where something like this comes up, just what's the nicest thing you can do? That's going to be the answer to the question. Okay, now sometimes you need to help somebody else or you just want to help somebody else, uh, you know, to, to learn, to try it out. So assuming it's your radio station, so you're the control operator, you own it. And you want to have your kid or somebody else try it out. That's fine, but you have to be there. You are the control operator. You can't walk away. You can't let them use it on your own. You let that person use your call sign. So if you're a VA3XYZ, that kid, that person is going to be VA3XYZ while they're using the radio under your supervision and control. Okay. Even if you're relaying messages for other people, you can do that. You can relay messages, but anything you relay, you have to follow the amateur content and country by country rules. Doing it something for somebody else is not an excuse to break the rules. So again, no business communications, no encrypted communications, unless the algorithm and the key are out there. Uh, you know, the country to country rules we talked about where you have to make sure if you're touching communication, you're communicating with somebody in another country that you're abiding by the rules of that country as well. Okay. If you are letting somebody else use your radio who has the same license as you, either of you can be the control operator. So you can use your call sign. That person can use their call sign, even though it's on your radio. If you have different licenses, basic, one of you has basic, one of you has advanced, uh, the rules applicable are the ones for the lowest level of control operator or station operator. So uh, if I'm operating the station and I have a basic license, but I'm, you know, it's a, uh, the station of an advanced operator who has more power and stuff than I have, I have to follow the rules and only operate that thing at the power level I'm allowed to operate it at. Okay. Now, that's a bunch of rules. Uh, this is our first quiz. You're going to think, man, that's a lot to absorb. Uh, that's why you go to quiz one. Start running through it. Uh, and like we said, run it through three times and... Betcha you'll be clearing it at 90% or better by the third time. And again, we are the YLab Makerspace. Uh, thank you for listening. Click on the links below if you like this. And uh, once you get through that quiz, the next one we recommend is number two.